coffee urns on utility trucks furnish the firemen with their favorite drink, Java, strong, black, and hot. Oil fires present a unique firefighting problem. Fomite companies carrying cans of foam powder and portable foam generators are in constant readiness to suppress such fires. Foam powder dumped in the hopper of the generator is mixed with the moving column of water and flows from the nozzle in a sticky mass that has a strong smothering effect. Crash trucks, speedy fire control units, protect the city's airports and extinguish aircraft fires so that immediate rescue of the occupants can be accomplished. In addition, they prevent the spread of such fires to other property. Rescue companies, strategically located throughout the city, respond with life-giving oxygen on all calls demanding emergency resuscitation. Firemen assigned to these units are well versed in all branches of first aid. But the majority of their calls require the administration of oxygen for respiratory failure. This condition is usually caused by drownings, electric shock, heart attacks, and the inevitable attempts at self-destruction, suicide. The duties of the fire chief may be likened to those of a general manager. He works in close alliance with a civilian board of fire commissioners who determine broad matters of policy. Routine department procedures are formulated by the deputy chief. And assistant chief officers who are in command of the three major divisions of the firefighting forces within the city. Divisions are further divided into battalions, each of which consists of a number of fire stations housing firefighting units. Each battalion is under the supervision of a battalion chief who responds to and takes charge of all fires within his battalion. He is responsible for the efficient operation of the companies under his command. Direct control of individual firefighting units is relegated to captains. Engineers or pump operators auto firemen or drivers, tillermen, a kind of backseat driver, hosemen, truckmen, and salvage men complete the line of rank. All firemen are appointed and promoted under civil service. Applicants for original appointment are required to pass a written examination. Strenuous physical agility tests. and are subject to close medical scrutiny before acceptance. After appointment, rookies are sent to the drill tower, where they are given an intensive training course. Here a man first becomes familiar with the tools of the trade. Classroom sessions are also a part of the training course. 
Those who pass are assigned to fire companies where they serve a six-month probationary period before becoming regular members of the fire department. Here is the heart of the fire department, through which all communications pass. When the glass in a street fire alarm box is broken and the hook is pulled down, the number of the box is received on one of these registers and is immediately relayed by a selective transmitter to those firefighting units who, by prearrangement, would respond to a box alarm at that location. A quick check informs each captain of the box location, the first alarm assignment, and the additional companies that will respond on a second or greater alarm. Need for additional help can only be determined after the arrival of the first company at the fire. When fires are reported by telephone, the correct address must be given if the fire department is to send aid. A quick check of the map. And the fire dispatcher relays the address to the nearest fire companies by direct wire. In reporting the location of a fire, remember, is it street, avenue, drive, or place? Accurate check is kept of the movements of all units by the fire dispatcher. The transmission of orders to units out of quarters is expedited by the use of two-way radio. Units in the field may communicate with each other as well as with the fire dispatcher. Fires which cause a loss exceeding $100 or that appear to be of a suspicious or incendiary nature are thoroughly investigated by members of the Arson Bureau, the detectives of the fire service. Determining the cause of fires is important. It contributes greatly to fire control, for obviously, when the cause of fire is known, steps can be taken by the fire department to prevent similar occurrences. The questioning of witnesses or suspicious characters and the careful examination of evidence usually results in the apprehension of individuals guilty of the crime of arson. And, of course, ultimate prosecution. Such fires are motivated by profit, revenge, hate, or to satisfy the perverted desires of the mentally unbalanced, the pyromaniac. The prevention of fire goes hand in hand with its extinguishment and is considered by many authorities to be of equal importance. Good fire prevention practices keep unwanted fires from occurring in the first place. Fire laws and ordinances are formulated by fire prevention authorities and engineers well acquainted with the hazards 
in various occupancies and industries. Such laws are based upon past fire experience, and their prime objective is to prevent fire. Enforcement is the responsibility of the fire department. For this purpose, it maintains a fire prevention bureau. Inspectors, all of whom have had actual firefighting experience, are well versed in existing fire regulations. These men conduct thousands of inspections each year, seeking out and correcting fire and light hazards. Particular attention is given to manufacturing and industrial plants where the potential fire hazard is most severe. A close watch is maintained in places where large numbers of people congregate. It is here that the life hazard is greatest. Hospitals and sanitariums housing bedridden and invalid persons are inspected regularly. And safety campaigns are year-round procedure in our schools. Life-saving devices are useless if they fail to operate in an emergency. and poorly maintained auxiliary firefighting appliances are worse than useless. As a breeder of fire, poor housekeeping is one of the worst offenders. Failure to cooperate in correcting such conditions may result in prosecution. Fires after 10 a.m. and faulty incinerators are also a fire prevention problem. For many years, captains of firefighting companies have made routine building inspections to acquaint themselves with conditions that might affect firefighting operations. Now, two-way radio makes it possible for entire companies to spread the gospel of fire prevention in their own district. Should fire occur while they are engaged in this work, the fire dispatcher may contact them immediately, since one man always remains within hearing distance of the radio. This program calls for personal contact with each and every homeowner to explain the common hazards responsible for most home fires and to make sure regulations governing these hazards are thoroughly understood. To further aid this educational work, the general public is reached by direct mail, by newspaper releases, and frequent radio broadcasts. Beyond this point, the fire department must rely on public cooperation. The fight against fire is a never-ending fight. Each year, thousands of lives are sacrificed and millions of dollars worth of property go up in smoke. The tragedy is that most fires are preventable, that human carelessness accounts for most of them. Preventing fire is everyone's job, but the control and extinguishing of fires once started is the responsibility of the fire department. To this end, modern apparatus and equipment play an important part when manned by efficient, well-trained crews. A fireman's job is a hazardous one, a job of teamwork and preparedness. He must be ready at any moment of the day or night to come to your aid when fire or disaster strikes.
by the simple expedient of dialing 116 on your telephone or by breaking the glass and pulling the hook on a street fire alarm box. The fire protective resources of your fire department are at your service. But remember, report all fires promptly. For unless you do, how can we help you? <laughs>